my professional career started in interesting times, um, 25 years ago, um, when desktop publishing arrived. I think uh, probably you even didn't know this expression anymore because the time has so mu much changed since that. But at, in 1986, when we founded Page Magazine in Hamburg, uh, we directly um, started it with the, the desktop publishing. So you know, with those tools you all, you still have on your desk, uh, computers, um, laser printers or inkjet printers, and you can create your own um, pages uh, on, on the computer. This was new at that time because you always have to deal with several service providers um, who delivers you um, with uh, um, components of the pre-press process. And uh, even Apple realized and uh, it saved their life at that time because Apple had a bad year in uh, 1985 and 86. It saved their life because suddenly they found uh, the reason of, of being um, because they very well cooperated with companies like Adobe, um, Aldos PageMaker, um, and Linotype to define the desktop publishing revolution. And uh, at that time, a, a lot of people um, were, were new in this field because uh, even I, because I studied physics, but I was fascinated from these technologies that are so easy to access and affordable compared to the professional machines you had to buy in earlier times. So uh, we all more or less became self-educated. And the, the Bible we had at that time in Germany was Eric Spiekermann's book, um, Rhyme and Reason. And, uh, and maybe this is also the reason why, we, why I'm so interested in, in, in diving into the, to the, the branding things. In Germany, um, it's a little bit different than uh, here in the UK. Um, the industrial identities look pretty similar. And uh, we, we didn't have huge branding agencies that you have since, uh, for years. And uh, when you had something to solve in Germany, we had such, such kind of design popes you, you can uh, contact, like, you know, Ottel Eicher or Kurt Weidemann. And uh, they have practically uh, the monopole, uh, or they play monopoly with their um, part of the industry, doing business reports, you go to Olaf Loy. If you want to redesign a newspaper, go to Norbert Küpper and Kurt Weidemann. He was an expert in you know, creative uh, yeah, identities like Mercedes-Benz or uh, the German railway company, Die Bahn. Uh, but Eric, he was in London. He started in London and he uh, had a, he had an internship at Wolf Ollins, and, and at this time he learned how um, you know corporate design and design industries really can work, and he just decided to found Meta Design, that become actually in in its in the form it is Germany's first um, corporate and des yeah, corporate design uh, consultant company, not just doing business cards, but you know doing more, looking behind the curtains of, of companies <clears throat> and make them successful with design. This is um, just one example of uh, such a company that hasn't changed fast. Um, you, can't exact, uh, you can't really um, identify who it is. You need to put a logo on it and uh, the name of the, the company and then you have Lufthansa. Of course, they change now after you know, 30 years. They've changed their identity uh, very, very late. So uh, a lot of things happened in the recent 12 years. If you think about digit digitization, mobile, and all those things. But now, uh, finally, uh, they decided to update their corporate design. This is a period of time. It's, mu it's much too long. And we want to put more velocity into these processes. And this is also a reason why we, why we do uh, these kind of events, especially in the German region. The Brits, of course, they know how to you know, identify or how to design um, a, a flight carrier um, without using needed without to need a logo, but it's it, it's immediately identifiable. So let's just let me uh, make a short history back. What's branding? Um, you all know uh, this is where the the term comes from. By the way, it's a German word that is uh, part of this word. Brand brand means you know fire. And uh, 
this is how it all started, but it changed a lot over the years. And ac actually, it's pretty simple, I would say, um, pretty simple in, um, to define a brand. You just need a, three or four ingredients. Of course, you need color. So I have decided to make an example here. And then you need a form or several forms or a combination of forms. You need type. And finally, if it's not enough, uh, you have to have a key visual to make the print um, identifiable. And uh, that's done. So, and um, this is how it looks today. We have, we are, right now we can notice the separation of the visual and the, the written um, brand name. Other brands um, have the same principle. And of course, to separate the visual from the brand name, it's uh, one result of digitization um, because you have all those tiny uh, profile images in uh, Facebook, Twitter, and so on. And uh, if you write longer words uh, in this um, field, uh, in these spaces, you can't read it in small sizes. The problem uh, with color, let's go through all those uh, parts. The problem with color is that the, you know, the basic ones, they are all occupied uh, for years from various companies. So it's very pretty hard to find a unique color for your brand. Even uh, the nuances, they are all taken uh, if you look among those startup companies. And uh, there's another thing happening with color. We don't have an absolute recognition of color. So I'll make a short test um, for you. Um, try to save this pink color and try to find out um, in these pant on these Pantone chips. They all, ex they all exist. It's, it's real. What was the pink Panther uh, pink? Any idea? No. Twelve. <laughs> Similar basic forms. Um, so let's let's have a look. What what's available? We have triangles. We have uh, um, pentagrams. We can make them. Um, filled but, and outlined, we can condense them and expand them, um, turn them uh, by 180 degrees. And yes, it's fine, but you know, m all of, of those forms are heavily in use, and it's also not possible to find something exclusive in this field. Some people say, yeah, but key visuals, key visuals are very important, it always works. And uh, now it don't work if you take the wrong typeface, so it doesn't look like a film festival anymore if you use Comic Sans. So what's the power of type? And I think you guess it, what's my mission? From all those four, ingredi four ingredients, color, form, key visual, and type, I, th I, th I say type is the most important one. The first reason is, we have a kind of unlimited selection of typefaces. I think there are around 100,000 typeface families available today. And, but you can distinguish them much better than color. And if they are similar, there's all, always the possibility to customize them. You can change some letters, of course, with the help of the type designer. You shouldn't do it yourself. It's not allowed because your, your license doesn't allow it. And uh, another essential thing that type carries the information. And this gives type and the written word a special role because we are always getting in contact with those texts. We read it. It's, it's a touch point that is recurring. And this is why I say that uh, it's the only true visual const constant in branding. And another thing, it happens subconscious. So this process is inevitable. Um, cl customers, clients, they can't explain why they recognize um, things immediately. Oh, but this is um, not unusual. If, if you have a film 
if you listen to good music and uh, you need to explain, you know, why is this song make me dance immediately? Musicians know why it is and what's happening in the uh, in the studio with all those rhythm components. But um, but if you're not a musician, you also can dance to the music and you get immediately uh, a kick out of it without knowing the rules that are behind uh, uh, the music composition and uh, things like that. <clears throat> now I want to make a test now with you. I show you now um, a claim of a world famous brand. And um, don't shout out the brand name, just uh, lift your hand if you know what brand it is. three, four, five people, but three of them are from our company, so this. <laughs> so now I switch over to the brand's corporate typeface. Um, now, who knows it now? Please raise your hand. Good quote, yes. So it's Mercedes-Benz. They have a corporate typeface for 30 years and uh, they use it heavily and uh, this this brings them in a position like here you see they don't need to to write their their brand name on on trucks like this because just the typeface is enough to for the clients and the fans of the brand to recognize ah this um, truck is is on the road for my favorite car comp car brand I end this presentation with Kenyon, so we had, unfortunately, uh, they couldn't make it to come for the weather reason, but um, this is a, an example I always have in my presentation, also for six, seven, eight years, um, because we once helped them to make this um, um, corporate typeface, this logo typeface. Kenyon is a, uh, it starts 10 years ago as a, a very small bike manufacturer with 20, 20 people. Uh, I've learned last, um, last week in Cologne when they did, did their presentation that they are now the biggest uh, a bike manufacturing company. Uh, they bike, they sell their bikes internationally and there are now 400 plus people. Um, why did they do, how did they do it and why did they do it? They took a lot of care in constructing their frames and uh, the, to design their bikes. They're really great product designers, and so um, the day comes that they say, hey, this has to be um, shown in our corporate design and in our logo. And uh, so um, KMS team in uh, Munich, they developed, they, they started to develop a, a brand uh, design, a brand logo. And uh, it's not easy for a bike company to you know brand your product because um, there's not much space on bikes, and so they decided to make this unique typeface. It's slanted to the left, uh, what is uh, unique in its own. They cut it to make it as big as possible. They use uppercase letters. and uh, But this causes an interesting effect, a kind of three-dimensional effect, if you see this uh, in, in the bike's design. Uh, just to compare it, this is Helvetica. It's pretty static. But, you know, just um, to change this gives us an impression, hey, uh, there's something going on there. And uh, it's, of course, used in, uh, on, on the bikes, but also in the website and the, in their catalogs. It's a headline typeface. It's not meant for reading text. And when I um, called uh, the marketing director of Kenyon some years ago. He said, oh, we have a huge problem uh, in Switzerland because there's also a bike manufacturer with the same name and we are not allowed to use the name Kenyon in Switzerland. This is, makes us unhappy because the Swiss people, they want to buy our bikes. They have money, they have nice mountains and, uh, and they are sporty and, and we, won't talk, we won't stop this business. So what can we do? And then, yeah, they tweaked a little bit their website. Uh, this is the Swiss website, and this is the German website. And if you have, if you look a little bit more in detail, you know, it's a shirt or at the bike. They removed the Kenyan logo wherever they can, so it doesn't appear actually. But and and the bikes, um, 
there's not written Canyon on the bike, but the model of the bike. In this case, this Ultimate is the model name. And then he's, the, the marketing guy says to me, we've been at a bike fair and the Swiss dealers, they came to us and they didn't actually notice that it's not, that it's not written Canyon on their bikes. And I think this is a perfect proof how far you can go uh, with a good typeface for a brand um, to make your product recognizable, in this case, without showing your brand name. And I think this is the perfect example. Unfortunately, we couldn't hear it uh, now, today, from, from their agency and from them. Thanks a lot for my introduction. Thank you.